Reactive Attachment Disorder, or RAD, falls under the trauma and stressor-related disorders in the DSM. I found two articles that I'll be discussing. One looks at the diagnosis from an evolutionary perspective, focusing on how RAD developed as an adaptation to survive when a child did not have primary caregivers. The second looks at whether there is reduced visual cortex gray matter in children and adolescents diagnosed with RAD. It has been suggested that the behaviors associated with a formal diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder may stem from a functional adaptation rather than mental health diagnosis. The Belberni article suggested that RAD may be a facultative response to enhance the probability of survival that is triggered by certain conditions. These conditions include the need to fend for oneself following the loss of dedicated caregiving or a lack of opportunity to build relationships with caregivers intermixed with neurobiological and psychological consequences of maltreatment. A child may develop the behaviors associated with RAD as a survival mechanism following being orphaned, abandoned, or irresponsibly reared. The article suggests reframing RAD as multiple choice attachment so that it could be seen as an evolved response to certain tragic environmental cues. Multiple choice attachment involves choosing between interchangeable caregivers on the basis of immediate opportune decision making. This strategy allows children to survive what was once a common and major peril, for example, the loss of parents. Efforts to endure the harsh reality of the absence of caregivers favor the retention and transmission of genes containing the code for a mechanism that responds to environmental information. This indicates that expanding attachment to encompass what might be described as multiple choice preference would now be an appropriate strategy. Human behavior evolved within the group environment of small, kin-related, extremely adaptable, interdependent nomadic tribe of hunter-gatherers. Attachment behavior became further refined by a range of repetitive social conditions in this setting. Our ancestors existed in a state of continual fear and danger of violent death with short lifespans. Things which threatened human life included accidents, natural disasters, disease, general wear and tear, childbirth, and potential warfare. This led to a constantly threatened existence. The chances of one's caregivers being here one day and then gone the next were extremely high, making this the sort of stable adaptive problem which could generate a heritable psychological solution. The route to survival for a solitary child would include keeping an eye out for their best chance, and in the best of cases, this would be in the tribal context of kin, accustomed to cooperative caregiving. Attachment that was not reciprocated would create a disadvantage by reducing opportunism and flexibility. Those unable to produce a viable alternative tactic would be less likely to pass their genes on to future generations. Each formation of insecure attachment would be an adaptive response to environmental risk and uncertainty. During times of extreme peril, such as warfare or disaster, being orphaned, lost, or abandoned would be more likely, and available adults able to repeatedly spare energy from their own survival less likely. With the goal of passing on genes, these children would be gaining characteristics crucial for reproductive success in an uncertain adulthood. These could include behaviors congruent with disinhibited behaviors that optimize survival since future reproductions depend on staying alive. In our ancestral surroundings, this could have been an example of a fitness-enhancing behavior pattern honed by evolution and established as an option within the general population as part of the process of adaptation. If a, parent's child, if a child's parents came to an untimely end, and no adult came forward to take responsibility for the child. Their best chance of surviving to reach reproductive age would lie in making use of whoever came to hand as a temporary source of aid. There is little evidence that the adoption of unrelated individuals has occurred with any frequency over most of the human evolution history, which leads to the idea that evolution may have refined multiple choice attachment behavior because it paid off. In the modern-day condition of orphanages and foster care, there are often a high number of caregivers rotating in and out of children's lives. This setting may trigger a tendency to choose between interchangeable caregivers on the basis of immediate, opportune decision-making. 
This strategy allows children to survive what was once a common and major peril, like the loss of parents. Multiple choice attachment would not only have had survival advantages in hunter-gatherer environments of evolutionary adaptiveness, the practice of abandoning children, both babies and older children, was common even in the comparatively recent past. Diffusing the attachment system would enable an abandoned child to move among a pool of caregivers on a brief encounter basis. Even if this desperate tactic for survival worked for a minority of children, the genes enabling the activation of that behavior would be retained and remain as a potential within the population. If multiple choice attachment is viewed as a course of action that gives a child the emotional and behavioral responses to make the best of a physically dangerous situation, then parental deprivation has not so much caused a disorder as has activated a survival response tailored to this particular situation. A couple disclaimers. The Valbermi study is more of a hypothesis as no, they haven't really explored whether or not the gene they talk about actually exists or not. Um, also, most of the research on reactive attachment disorder has been conducted on only early childhood with little research on the disorder beyond. And the current DSM, DSM-5, distinguishes two separate disorders, reactive attachment disorder and disinhibited social engagement disorder. disorder. Um, both are defined as stressor-related disorders that involve social neglect during childhood. Um, most research hasn't yet separated into these two different disorders since they were conducted before the DSM came out. Um, they're based on the DSM-4 criteria when both were considered to be reactive attachment disorder instead of two separate disorders. Um, other than article that I found, there's not a lot of research on structural abnormalities in reactive attachment disorder. The one that I did find examined whether there's reduced visual cortex gray matter volume in children and adolescents. Um, in this study, high resolution MRI data sets were obtained for children and adolescents diagnosed with RAD compared to typically developing control subjects. There were 21 subjects diagnosed with RAD ranging in ages from 10 to 17 years old, with a mean age of 12.76 years, and then 22 control subjects with a mean age of 12.95 years. All of the subjects were scanned with a 3 Tesla MR scanner. Whole brain structural images were analyzed, controlling for age, gender, full scale IQ, and total brain volume. The gray matter volume, or a GMV, was significantly reduced by 20.6% in the left primary visual cortex, Brodmann's area 17, of the RAD group compared to the typically developing group. This GMV reduction was related to an internalizing problem measured by the Strength and Difficulties Questionnaire. Combined with previous studies of adults with childhood maltreatment, early adverse experiences such as sensory deprivation may affect the development of the primary visual system, reflecting in the size of the visual cortex in children and adolescents with RAD. These visual cortex GMV abnormalities may also be associated with the visual emotion regulation impairments of RAD, leading to an increased risk for later, later psychopathology. It's worth noting that in this study, the left occipital visual cortex was the only brain region affected by the symptoms of RAD. So, to review the results from the study, a whole brain analysis was conducted to examine regional differences in gray matter volumes between groups. The RAD group, in comparison with the typical developing group, showed reduced GMV in the left primary visual cortex. A 20.6 average reduction of GMV was found in the identified regions of the RAD group when compared to the typically developing group. To confirm the trend of the occipital GMV reduction further, the authors of the study used a lower criterion for statistical significance. The left inferior occipital temporal cortex exhibited a marginally significant decrease in GMV in the RAD group relative to the typically developing group. Overall, reduced GMV in the RAD group was shown on the left side of the occipital cortex, extending anteriorly towards the inferior occipital temporal cortex. This study provides the first real evidence demonstrating that children and adolescents with RAD 
exhibit structural abnormalities in the left primary cortex. Given that RAD patients showed reduced or absent expression of positive emotions during routine interactions with caregivers, this, this study's authors proposed that the <coughs> reduction of GMV in the left visual cortex identified here may be associated with a malfunction in the neural circuit regulating positive emotional visual images based on the children exposed to child adversity who may have difficulty recognizing positive emotional expressions and difficulty with regulating positive emotions. This could be a really good starting point for further research in this area. A couple of limitations to note with this study though, they had small group sizes. Um, the whole brain analysis approaches are limited by the need to adjust for multiple comparisons in order to minimize the risk of detecting chance related differences and only the most robust differences in brain structure emerge. Uh, the study also used a cross-sectional design that precludes the identification of causal links between RAD and the GMV differences. The authors believe more longitudinal studies are needed so that they can look at the differences associated with RAD and any intervention that they go through. There were substantial IQ differences in the study with the RAD group showing a lower overall full-scale IQ when compared to the typically developing group. Um, so that could have caused some differences. And also there were developmental differences in the ages. A 17-year-old's not at the same pace developing that a 10-year-old is. Um, and that is it. Any questions, drop them below. Thanks.